On This Week in Enterprise Tech, cryptocurrency grows up, Satya Nadella one year after, and Hit Archive comes on to talk about the future of optical storage. Twyatt on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twyatt, This Week in Enterprise Tech, Episode 129, recorded February 6, 2015, for February 23, 2015. Hit Archive and the Future of Optical Storage. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter makes hiring faster, easier, and cheaper. Post your job to 50-plus job boards with one click. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four-day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash Twyatt. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Twyatt. And by PagerDuty. PagerDuty decreases alerting noise for IT operations and developers to ensure that the right engineers are notified at the right time. Increase your uptime and sign up for a 14-day free trial at pagerduty.com slash twit. And by Ring Central, the business phone system that's in the cloud. Ring Central now integrates with Google for work. Try Ring Central with a 30-day risk-free trial. Visit ringcentral.com or call 800-543-9980 and use the promo code TWIT. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Ballaser, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. And I'm joined by my regular cast of cohorts, starting with Mr. Brian Chi, the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii. Brian, uh, here in California, we're getting this Pineapple Express, is what they call it, which I think means we're getting your weather. So whose weather are you getting? Uh, don't know, but you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we do need the rain. How are things over there? That's pretty good. I am completely and totally swamped. I'm actually, when people say, I need help today, I go, no, next week. Sorry, dude. Good. Well, thank you for making time for uh, this special episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Also joining us from the other coast is Mr. Curtis Franklin from Information Week Radio. Curtis, I know you just got off the air with Information Week Radio. So again, along with Brian, thank you for making time for This Week in Enterprise Tech. Padre, it's always a pleasure. I'll make time for the Twyatt Riot just about any time, uh, especially when this airs. I will have just gotten back to the swamp from uh, a week in New York City, so it's nice to be back in a place where I don't have to wear a parka and mucklucks just to walk to the corner. You know, the weather is worth it just to hear you say mucklucks. Let's get right to it. We're going to be talking a little bit about optical storage today, but before we do that, Let's jump into the blips. Now, the Super Bowl of wireless networking just ended. The New England Patriots and the Seattle Seahawks weren't the only teams that were butting heads at the Super Bowl this year. Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, and T-Mobile used the occasion of the big game to tout their off-field performance. Verizon customers used 4.1 terabytes of data at the game, up from 1.9 terabytes last year. AT&T customers scored with 1.7 terabytes of data transfers. Sprint booked 754 gigabytes of data, and T-Mobile customers accounted for 430 gigabytes of data. Though T-Mobile was quick to point out that their data speeds were the fastest at 13.2 megabits per second versus 11.4 for second place Verizon. However, with almost 10% the amount of data usage, it seems pretty clear that Verizon should be handed the victory. Of course, since Verizon is the official wireless provider of the Seattle Seahawks, they would probably prefer to pass it. Encrypt, encrypt, oh darn. We keep talking about how important it is to encrypt critical data, whether it's moving or in place. Well, someone should have told the folks at Anthem because word has come that all of the personal information exposed in the largest healthcare breach in history was just sitting there in nice, plain text. That's right. The good people of Anthem decided that perimeter security was all it took to keep the bad guys out and the HIPAA folks happy. 
Let that be a lesson to you. Now, the liability is mounting and the regula regulators haven't yet begun to take their toll. What, besides customer personal information, is the takeaway here? That's right. If you don't want hackers to have it, encrypt, encrypt, encrypt. Well, Google is not so enamored with the MBA approach to business. In an article by VentureBeat, the Google hiring chief explains that they don't give much credit to college degrees in the hiring process. They instead concentrate on re-educating their people on design things for unexpected results and downplays the Gantt charts and concrete business plans currently taught by schools. I, for one, second that motion, and the world needs to pay less attention to the inflexible finance-driven planning taught by business schools around the world and more on results-driven flexibility that can respond to changes. This inflexibility has led to the loss of leadership by some pretty big organizations as they get so caught up in only the bottom line that they miss the boat as the world changes around them. Yes, we need to plan way out into the future, but not if we sacrifice the ability for flexibility. My motto is, make a decision. So what if it's wrong after a couple of years? As long as we don't ignore our market, we should be able to meet those changes when we need to. Could Microsoft HoloLens make video conferencing and collaboration fun again? Us jaded IT folks have seen the cycle before. New tech is announced that will forever change the face of communication. New tech is implemented. New tech has bugs. New tech gets patched. New tech becomes boring. People stop using the new tech with any sense of excitement. Well, at least one group thinks that they've got tech that can change communications and keep it fun. And it all starts with the Microsoft HoloLens. The Hyper Voice Consortium has been working on next generation video communications, and they think that Microsoft's newest tech could allow for the holy grail of telepresence, individually tailored stimuli. Recognizing that every participant in a telepresence session works best with his or her own level of stimuli, they believe that the future of effective communications is not in creating the same boring room and wall pattern and fake tree for participants, but in allowing each to make the telepresence session perfect for themselves. One user with a flood of information in overlays, another with minimalist decorations that they can focus on with the content, and still another with a fully rendered visual world placing the conference in the forests of Endor. SAP's S4 HANA will make your enterprise better. Uncle Hasso says so. SAP has announced a bunch of new applications and services for S4 HANA, and many of them point in one direction. It's time for your company to embrace the in-memory future and move to HANA. SAP Hefe Hasso Plotner showed a demo designed to prove that, logic and experience notwithstanding, you really don't need a monster server to move critical analysis to HANA. He touted the system's ability to deliver near instantaneous analysis of complex ad hoc queries. Now, in addition, SAP showed mobile and cloud apps leading to the inevitable conclusion that SAP and its customers are intent on providing real-time analysis to every employee everywhere in the organization. Keep listening. SAP's annual Sapphire Conference is coming, and it promises to be a show with quite a lineup of new products and services for the large and medium-sized enterprise. Well, poaching employees has always been a way of life in Silicon Valley. Now The Verge reports that Tesla is going after Apple employees by the bushel. Talent poaching has always been a part of the tech industry, and Verge's report that Tesla is looking for talent interested in helping them change the world of automotive design. The article goes on to say that Tesla's ability to attract top coders would be more important at cars get more high tech, to which I say, bravo. So unless you have a... Unless you have Ford Blue in your veins, the consumer is looking for cards to provide more and more services in the vehicle. And Tesla has been the benchmark that other auto uh, makers are attempting to follow. To the big three American automakers, I say watch carefully and invest in high-tech education. Your end game is in horsepower. It's a smarter vehicle and being able to make them smarter over time, not the status quo. Even though Google has spent a large fortune on building out their in-house capabilities in recent years, many still think of them as the same services company that Warren Buffett liked a decade ago because, quote, they could make money hand over fist without spending any. Even those who know that Google is in the process of transforming themselves don't put them at, in the same footing as the old guard of Silicon Valley. After all, exactly how much does a search company need to spend? 
Well, according to the latest round of company financial disclosures, Google spent more on building out their capital plant than Intel in 2014. Intel spent $10 billion on property manufacturing plants and tooling to build their chips, while Google spent $11 billion on the same. In other words, that old service company spent more on hardware than the largest chip manufacturer in the world. Uh, when we come back, we're going to be diving into the Enterprise Bytes. But before that, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the first sponsor of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and it's ZipRecruiter. Now, these days, hiring is more than just about finding someone the, with the right qualifications, the right skill set. It's all about finding that qualified candidate who can actually fit into the culture, the environment of your business. I've done my share of hiring, and the process was always the same. Post a job listing, get candidates, screen candidates, hire the best candidate, and then regret it half the time. The problem is that you need to cast a wide net to ensure that you're getting the best candidates. And you need to put your postings in places where you'll find the candidates who are right for your position and culture. That's why we're proud to have ZipRecruiter as part of the Twilight Riot. ZipRecruiter understands that posting your job in one place just really isn't enough to find quality candidates these days. If you want to fi find the perfect hire, you need to post your job on all the top job sites. And that's what ZipRecruiter does for you. With ZipRecruiter.com, you post your job once and it gets placed on 50 plus job sites, including Craigslist, LinkedIn, and Twitter, all with a single click. ZipRecruiter will help you find candidates in any city, any industry, nationwide. Just post once and watch your qualified candidates roll in to ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use interface. There will be no juggling of emails or calls to your office. Instead, you'll quickly scan the candidates, rate them, and then hire the right person fast. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by over 250,000 businesses. Right now, our listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free. For that free four-day trial, go to ZipRecruiter.com slash twiet. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash twiet. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Let's get to the bites. Chibert, Curtis, here's an interesting scenario. Let's say you decide that you're done with the whole Bitcoin craze and you don't want to share out your CPU cycles anymore because it just doesn't make sense. But you do want to participate in some sort of online currency. Well, there's a company that's trying to change the way you think about shared resources by using your hard drive. Storage, which is spelled S-T-O-R-J, is a startup that is looking to create a decentralized cloud storage platform that can't be censored, monitored, or suffer downtime. The way that they propose making the platform happen is to use your storage and internet connection to distribute multiple copies of their customers' data. Now, theoretically, if they had a large enough data user base, not only would such a platform be snoop-resistant and downtime-adverse, but it would be crazy fast because you would have way more aggregate throughput. Now here, here are the logistics. Data is encrypted client side before it enters the network. Each encrypted file is then split into chunks and the chunks are then again encrypted and distributed across the storage network. Users get to decide how redundant their data will be, how quickly they need to be able to access that information, and then they would also be allowed to use their connections and their drives to build up storage coin, which would will allow them to use storage cloud services. It's, it's not a new idea. This is basically what we've been doing when we've been sharing resources across the internet. But this is the first company I can think of that really wants to turn it into a sustainable business model. Chibert, let me start by talking to you. This is essentially the same technology that's being used, the blockchain, by cryptocurrency. This is the encryption method that they're trying to use. And except instead of making useless calculations, useful work is done because you are doing something for someone else. You are selling them a service and you're getting paid for that service that you provide. Is is this grown up Bitcoin? You know, I don't know. You know I I'm not wild about sharing my computing resources because the second I start sharing it, that also opens a potential vulnerability. So for the researcher that's really paranoid about leaking, you know, research data, not going to happen. Now for the home user or for someone that's doing ca more casual computing, yeah, I see this is happening. And that's probably the same kind of market that Bitcoin is in. Um, but I don't know, you know, it, it sounds great. Um, I'd rather implement it within 
say, a controlled environment like a university and have it spread across the university, but going out into the public, I don't know. Jury's out on this one. There is, there is that interesting security implication, though, because if you take a file and you encrypt it and then you break the file apart and you re-encrypt it, essentially, if they are able to break that first wrapper of encryption, they still don't have a file that they could decrypt. They don't have the ability to reverse engineer what was originally in the packet because they don't have a complete uh, uh, file that they can they can turn back into tech into clear text. So you know, for me, I, I understand what you're saying, Chibert, but I think there's another use here, and that's for people who want to have data that really can't be accessed by anyone anywhere except them. I mean, is that worth it? Maybe. Um, I'm not really concerned so much about the encrypted data. That's, you know, that's pretty good, solid technology. What okay. I'm concerned about is how do you provide access to it? Okay. That yeah. access is the issue, not the encryption. Right, right. Actually, let, let me talk to Curtis about that. Curtis, there, let, let's get away from the privacy concerns because, of course, we could always go down a rabbit hole with that. But there is another part of this technology which does sound promising, and that's the ability for the user to decide what kind of level of redundancy they would have on that data. You can pay more in storage coin for having your data distributed across multiple clients, far more clients than you need, so that you guarantee uptime. I mean, even if you've got large swaths of the Internet going down, if you're highly distributed enough then enough of those will be available for you to have a decent aggregate throughput to your data. Uh, and it also decentralizes as a server. So it's not like you can knock out a data center and suddenly lose access to your data as long as enough clients are there for you to reassemble that original encrypted file, you can get your data back. Is, is that something that you think enterprise would A, understand, and B, allow for? If we're talking enterprise in North America or even in Western Europe, I think that the answer is that they would understand it perfectly well, but that they're highly unlikely to make use of it. The place where I can see this being a very important service uh, are in some of the developing nations. Let's say you're in a place where you have a very shaky infrastructure and perhaps even a very shaky public safety infrastructure. Well, in a case like that, being able to pay for a widely distributed backup and even a highly redundant widely distributed backup could be the difference between staying in business and losing everything in the event of a disaster. Now, because of, of regulations, because of the experience they've had in other areas, and, and just because of some, some basic business culture biases, I don't see any significant use of this by businesses in, like I said, North America, Western Europe, or, or even much of Asia. But when you start talking about businesses that may exist on parts of the Indian subcontinent in... Um, parts of Asia, Western Asia especially, and in Africa, I see some huge opportunities there and some tremendous service to be gotten out of something like this. Right. Titus in the chat room is saying, well, how about a 20 hard drive RAID 0 instead and encrypt data to boot? Well, but that's kind of the point. Even if you've got a wonderful RAID like that, which would be fast and it would be very redundant, it's still in one place. And even though you have encryption, you can still break that encryption. If you've got the file distributed over how many millions of computers that are in the network and none of them has a complete file, then not only is it fast, but it's pretty much impossible to take back. Chibert, one last question. Is this essentially just a darknet? Are we are, is storage trying to create another darknet? Uh, as, as Curtis said, this is probably not something that enterprise is going to get into. So the only people who may be interested in this would be those who have data that they're really paranoid about other people seeing. Oh, it's it's more than just that. It it's got a great. I I would think I'd go for it for things like making sure that no matter what, even if my home burns down, that I'll be able to still get access to, you know, my home data. And if it's spread around all over the all over the place, even a giant tsunami won't take away my 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 key data. Well, right now I'm uploading it to Glacier and. 
I'm actually all the way up to $9 a month for my storage. Not so bad. I think whether or not the home user takes advantage of this, it's actually going to be on the price. How much is it going to really right. cost? You know, those, those credits have to come from someplace. And I would imagine when you first set up your account, you're going to have to throw some real money in there. Otherwise, this company is not going to last. So one, is the technology sustainable? Two, what happens if the company tanks? Does that mean you lose all your data? They, I don't see any answer to that at the moment from their website. We'll have to find out. Or better yet, we'll let chat room find out. Let's go ahead and move on to the second story because we do have a special guest coming up who's going to be talking a little bit about offline, nearline optical storage. But before that, folks, it's been over a year now since Satya Nadella took over the reins at Microsoft. And I was hoping that Chibert Curtis and I could take a look at some of the highlights from his first year in the big chair. Uh, Chibert, one of the first things that I've noticed, and it's actually one of the first things that he did with his tenure, was this expansion of Office for iOS and Android. Now, you could say that this started under the bomber years, but it truly blossomed under Nadella, and it was it was given priority. It was something that they had to do. Do, do, you, do you connect that with Nadella, and how do you see that working out over the last year? Uh, I've been hearing about Office for mobile, you know, for a long time. You know, we've been going through reviewer workshops and talking about it. It just didn't seem to get a whole lot of traction under the Bomber administration. Uh, Sacha Nadella is a man that's more about breaking down barriers. And I think one of the biggest barriers he broke down actually was making sure that he didn't ignore the Android and iOS user community. And I think that more than anything else is going great guns to getting people to think Microsoft again. Uh, Microsoft has lost a lot of leadership. I think that actually has gone a long way to getting some of it back. Curtis, I want to throw in one over to you. The Surface Pro 3. Okay, we all understand that the original Surface, well, let's call it a debacle. Debacle was a bomber thing. It lost the company a lot of money. More importantly, it lost the company a lot of mind share. That was supposed to be the big thing that they had worked on, and it tanked. Well, under Nadella, we saw the release of the Surface Pro 3. And it's really the first one that you could say, yeah, this was entirely his tenure. He pushed this. They finally got a device that knew what, what it was. It was a hybrid tablet slash laptop. It wasn't a tablet that could kind of be a laptop. It wasn't a crippled laptop. It was it was designed to be somewhere in between. And, and I think the Surface Pro 3, many would agree, is actually a fine device for a decent price point. But bigger than that was the decisions that Nadella made about the other Surface products. Specifically, remember towards the start of his tenure, he decided that they weren't going to release smaller form factor surfaces and Surface RTs. And he's the one who has finally pulled the plug on the Surface RT altogether. What do you think about Nadella and the legacy of the Surface? Well, I think that the key thing for Nadella is that he made the decision to produce a piece of hardware that was good enough to stand on its own. He wasn't worried with this new Surface about competing with Microsoft's existing hardware partners. That's something that Ballmer had always kind of wrestled with. You know, they wanted to have hardware out there, but they didn't want to directly cannibalize sales from any of their hardware partners because they saw Windows licenses being so important to their overall revenue picture, and they weren't going to do anything that endangered the relationships that enabled them to keep selling Windows licenses by the boatload. Nadella has taken a step, maybe just a tiny step, away from dependence upon Microsoft um, Windows licenses as being the key source of their revenue. And so he's willing to do something that is actually competitive. Now, I'm sure that at some level he hopes that their hardware partners will be spurred to do things that are even more competitive. And I think at least one of their hardware partners, Lenovo, uh, has, has picked up that gauntlet. The uh, Lenovo, uh, with their yogas, are, are doing some very, very nice hardware. Um, 
but it, it really is a change in the understanding of what Microsoft's core business is. And just as important, I think, a change in the attitude of the executive suite toward both their customers and their partners that is letting Nadella change the way they bring out hardware and change the way they look at their overall revenue stream. The two are related, and the result is, I think, very positive for Microsoft in the, in the long term. Let's throw this next one to Chibert. Cloud and licensing, and Curtis touched on this a tiny bit. We have seen Microsoft under Nadella make a concerted effort and a lot of investment, billions of dollars of investment into their Azure cloud services and into revamping the way that they license Windows. Specifically, we could look at the enterprise cloud suite. We could look at Windows as a service. We could look at all the things that are surrounding the most recent announcements about the future of the Windows platform. This is definitely a Nadella thing because Bomber didn't want this at all. He didn't want to revamp the, the licensing. He didn't want to push cloud. Azure was there, but he didn't really understand what to do with it. Is this something that you hang on Nadella and say, right or wrong, this is his decision and it's really kind of the future of the company? Oh yeah, totally. Um, I actually had a presentation at a reviewer's workshop by Satya Nadella before he became the CEO and he was Mr. Hybrid Cloud. And Azure is never going to survive just trying to compete with Amazon on strictly on public cloud. No, what Azure really and truly needs and is going to make a big change is in the hybrid cloud because corporate America wants to keep their fingers on their primary data, but they don't want to have to spend huge amounts of money to plan for surge capability. They want to be able to go and buy it and then turn it off. That's going to be a big one. By the way, this is my one and only wine. I own two Surface RTs. Wine, <laughs> wine, wine. <laughs> I gave mine to my dad. <laughs> All right. Uh, over to you, Curtis. Windows 10. We got to talk about Windows 10 because it, it's actually pretty good. I've been using the release candidate for, for a while now. I've been, I've been playing with Windows 10 since they first allowed people to download it. It runs on almost everything, including the recent announcement that will run on a Raspi. It rolls back the most hated UI changes of Windows 8. It plays better with enterprise networks. It buries the RT strategy. You know, we don't let's not split the operating system and experience into multiple devices. And it gives us universal apps, which are apps that are aware of how they're being used, either on a tablet, on a desktop, on a laptop, on a mobile device. Windows 10 is Nadella's baby because it's a reversal of what Microsoft was doing. Good, bad, indifferent. By all reports, uh, the answer to that question is good, very good. Uh, I think I've heard more people uh, referring to Windows 10 and its relationship to Windows 8 uh, as being similar to Windows 7 and its relationship to Vista. Uh, in other words, Windows 10 is Windows 8 after it's been allowed to fully bake, uh, get rid of that gooey center. Um, the nice thing is that it also does something that is very, very historically Microsoft. You know, Microsoft, since the very beginning, has gone into a product category, put in a placeholder, and then iterated based on feedback until they finally got it right. We've seen them do this in product after product after product. Well, they shortened the chain on Windows 8 because they launched this new user interface, iterated very quickly, and have come out with Windows 10, which is, by all accounts, much better in just about every direction. I think that um, Windows 10 is going to be the kind of product that keeps the enterprise customers happy, keeps them uh, faithful to Microsoft, and also brings some of the consumers back into the Microsoft fold. You know, we're, we're seeing time after time consumers that had moved away from laptops, which meant that they moved away from, from uh, Microsoft, coming back. And while we're here talking about the enterprise, uh, I think everyone realizes now that the enterprise and consumer markets are linked inextricably. 
And you can't look at one without the other. For Microsoft, as it turns out, the consumer market is still where the numbers are. And uh, I have to believe that the shareholders are going to be very, very happy after 10 is in GA. Chebert, you get the last crack at this. This is the one that it, it actually thoroughly surprised us. Uh, even here at Twit, we were expecting just another Microsoft announcement. Great, they're going to take a look at Windows 10. We had all seen Windows 10. We didn't know what else they would add. And then they dropped the HoloLens on us, and people went nuts. Uh, it's it's technology that you know actually is in Microsoft's Ballywick. It was is a derivative of the Kinect that they have connected to the Xbox and the Xbox One, and it blew people away. It's this is AR the way it should be used. Remember, this is, these are the glasses that project directly onto your eyes. Uh, it's got fantastic tracking, again, owing to the, the company's use of entertainment systems. And people are now talking about how this, this is technology completely out of left field that could make Microsoft a market leader in a, an emerging category. This is definitely an Adela thing, yes? Yes, and actually, I... I started wondering where the heck it was as a product and wondering, wait, you guys are doing it with a whole bunch of connects in a room that you have to measure and do it. Why not just put it as goggles? Um, so I've actually been waiting for a HoloLens or something like it. Uh, now, I will say there's going to be some interesting competition. Uh, Intel's RealSense camera uh, is a slightly different way. They're saying, well, people don't necessarily need 3D, but they need the way to be able to gesture at the screen and manipulate the world. Uh, Microsoft's got a great product. I'm really looking forward to it. Intel's got an interesting product too. Um, I think the world is going to start becoming very, very interesting this year, especially as apps start coming out. Um, gamers, wow, amazing. But architects, uh, designers, uh, manufacturing, being able to manipulate the 3D world um, with human gestures and so forth, maybe combining the Intel with the HoloLens sounds, wow, can't wait. Can't wait indeed. Uh, when we come back, we're going to be bringing into the show a special guest, uh, president of Hit Archive, that's Horst Schellung. He's going to be talking about optical storage and uh, maybe what you want in your next storage vault for your business or enterprise. But before that... Let's take a moment to thank the second sponsor of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and it's PagerDuty. Now, the tech that we use in the enterprise gets more and more reliable with each generation. Servers fail over, switches, route around outages, and storage has redundancies for redundancies of redundancies. But no matter how sophisticated our tools may become, things still break, and they typically break when we least expect them to. And when it impacts your customers, you want to be woken from your deep slumber so that you can deal with the issue before it becomes a problem. Well, PagerDuty is an operations performance platform that delivers visibility and actionable intelligence to increase your uptime, the uptime of your apps, servers, websites, and databases. PagerDuty connects all of your systems into a single view, allowing you to see critical events across all your monitoring tools. It's an essential service if your business needs your software and services to always be up. It has over 100 ready-to-use integrations, including Nagios, New Relic, Keynote, App Dynamics, or you could roll your own with PagerDuty's APIs. You can customize it to fit how you and your team work, regardless of your location or your size. Oh, here's, here's how it works. When there's an incident, PagerDuty will first look through all your monitoring tools, filter and deduplicate the alerts, and then only then will it alert the proper staff. This reduces noise and false alerts and makes sure that only actionable alerts are delivered. After reducing that noise, PagerDuty checks on call schedules and personalized alerting preferences to automatically alert the right team and the right team member. Those alerts are dispatched across automated phone calls, SMS, email, and push notifications. Basically, any way that you've got to communicate, PagerDuty can use it. And PagerDuty will be distributed across multiple data centers and multiple hosting providers so your people will never miss an alert. Now, if the alerts are missed somehow, PagerDuty will automatically escalate issues to another team member until it's responded to. That means no more falling of issues between the cracks under the floorboards where they call real-world money problems. All of this means one thing. You can resolve incidents on the go while living your life, even when you're on call. 
Of course, PagerDuty isn't content to just tell you about problems. Its analytic tools will also identify common problems, allowing you to proactively make system improvements and prevent future, future outages. PagerDuty is trusted by thousands of companies, including Microsoft, GitHub, Boeing, Nike, Pinterest, and Box. If they trust PagerDuty, shouldn't you too? Now, right now, you can get the right engineer on the right problem at the right time. That's a lot of right. Visit pagerduty.com slash twit to sign up for a free 14-day trial. And for as little as $19 a month, you can increase your uptime with PagerDuty. And when you sign up for a new account, you'll also get a free T-shirt. That's pagerduty.com slash twit. pagerduty.com slash twit. And we thank PagerDuty for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. Let's get to the meat of the episode. We welcome to the show Mr. Horst Shalong. He is the president of Hit Archive Corporation. Horst, thank you very much for coming on to the show. Thank you. Now, Horst, you are the president of Hit Archive, which does optical storage, does storage solutions. Could you tell the folks who are playing along at home exactly what is Hit Archive? We are offering uh, prof professional solutions uh, based on optical storage. Now, optical storage is widely known as a consumer product, you know, CD, DVD, Blu-ray, but it's not viewed really as a professional product. Although, using Blu-ray, there is an opportunity to use it in uh, enterprise environments. And that's the product uh, category we are offering. Horst, there are going to be people in our audience, because we've got a very smart audience and a very skeptical audience, who will say, wait a minute, optical? Optical's dead. Haven't you heard? I mean, we've all heard that optical is no longer. I mean, physical media is going away. In fact, even hard drives are starting to die out. We're moving to flash memory storage, and we're, we're moving to cloud. Why, if I were running my own business, my own enterprise, should I consider an optical solution? Well, optical has some inherent advantages. Um, optical storage is a non-contact recording technology. What that means is it will last or it has the capability to last forever. You are not with a recording head in contact uh, with the recording surface and that means you are not, uh, you, you, you're not prone to um, have, have failures because the head gets really into contact and you're creating a head crash and you're losing data. And um, that is a, an inherent problem with today's hard disk and tape technologies, which are competitors to optical storage. Right, right. Uh, we've got some slides that uh, our TD is going to load up. We had them loaded up before uh, the, uh, the, the episode actually began. But I'd like you to take me through some of... The, the current technology that is available for optical storage. So when someone thinks optical storage, of course, they're going to think of DVDs. They might even think of CDs. And they're going to think of Blu-rays for higher capacities. But what's available right now and what applications are they being used in? Well, everybody knows CDs and DVDs and then Blu-rays. They are used for uh, distributing um, content. CDs was uh, music, DVDs was video, Blu-ray is high definition uh, video. Now, a big difference between Blu-ray and CD and DVD is that Blu-ray technology really is an IT technology. It's a sector-based medium. It's a uh, technology which is doing a write verification while it's writing. It is um, doing a defect management very similar to a hard disk. You can really um, envision Blu-ray as a very similar technology as hard disk. You are just using optical as the recording mechanism. Right. Oh, okay. We've got high tech in the chat room. He's a, he's a, a regular for the, the Twit TV network. Who is, he's saying what a lot of people are saying, which is, well, physical media is dying. And I, I know you already explained it, but could you please once again reinforce why we should be concerned about this optical media technology when we have people like that who are working in the field who say, look, I, I don't have to worry about any of this. Storage is now a magical black box that's taken care of by somebody else. Right. But somewhere at the end of the line, be it in a data center, be it in a you know, be it somewhere in a computer room, you have to store your data. It is not stored in thin air. At the end of the day, there is a, uh, a physical storage medium from where the data has to come. Yeah, exactly. That, and I think that's 
Oh, the old IT hacks will say, look, cloud is just another way of saying there's a box somewhere that you don't know where it is and it has all your stuff on it. Uh, the question is, what kind of media will that box be storing your data on? Uh, I, I want to move on to something else that uh, hopefully you can, you can shed some light on. When we look at next generation formats and roadmaps, are we just looking at an increase of density? Because that's what we saw with the movement from CD to DVD to Blu-ray and then denser Blu-ray. Are we just talking about packing more data onto the same amount of space? Or are we actually starting to see the advancement of technologies that will, say, improve archivability and survivability over time? Well, with Blu-ray, um, companies implemented professional drives, professional, uh, professional Blu-ray drives, which are used in library systems. And there are um, archive-grade media which have a reliability of more than 50 years, maybe 100 years or hundreds of years. And that really is a major advantage of optical storage. Optical storage will not um, lose data um, within, let's say, five or eight years, like a hard disk or tape, depending on its usage model. Uh, Blu-ray uh, uh, media you can use basically forever. There is no limit in uh, the number of reads. And um, it has a very long lifetime, very long media reliability. Now, Blu-ray was the first medium which was available in a professional drive and medium so that you can, in a professional environment, count on a very long reliability. As you move towards the next step, which will be a 300 gig medium, usually Blu-ray is used in 100 gig uh, um, capacity per medium today. But later this year, 2015, we will get to the 300 gig, uh, gig technology, and that continues to use the blue laser. It is very similar to Blu-ray in that it has three layers, three recording layers um, for the 100 gig um, medium, like Blu-ray. But with a 300 gig technology, it will go to 150 gigabyte and it will be used on both sides of the medium. Then there is a roadmap, which you see right now on the screen, um, which goes to 500 gig and one terabyte. All of these technologies will use double-sided technology, will use the blue laser and will use basically an available technology. Horst, what about uh, the, the off-spoken topic of bit rot? You hear that a lot when uh, people are talking about DVDs and CDs, that they weren't actually as reliable as we thought they would be. The same doesn't hold true for, for Blu-ray? That's correct. Blu-ray is made, at least on the professional side, is, uh, has a very different manufacturing process. Um, I think what you are talking about is that some stamped media were not the highest quality or we were using uh, media which were produced, um, let's call it cheaply. But um, with Blu-ray, we have um, professional um, technologies to create the recording layers. And on the sheet you see right now on this uh, red curve, you see that um, uh, reliability tests for, for current media, media we are using in the field, have a reliability of like a thousand years, a one a part per million failure in like more than a thousand years. I mean, people will say, well, in a thousand years, we will not have, you know, these drives anymore. And maybe they are right. But what it means is you don't need to migrate your data on a frequent basis. You um, uh, get peace of mind with the uh, media reliability of, of, these, of this technology. Right, right. Um, Horst, I can visualize some of the advantages of using this. So I, I understand optical media that I can record once and read as many times as I want is going to last a lot longer than a spinning drive or even an SSD. But then the questions start to creep into my mind of where would I use this in my enterprise? Because obviously, this is a nearline or offline storage medium. This is not going to be my, my primary storage uh, mm -hmm. device because it just doesn't have the performance. 
So how do you see this being used? What are the competitive competitive advantages and where would you see this being used inside of a, a, a 10,000 seat enterprise network? Well, you could use it in a data center and we started to develop a, a data center product together with Facebook. And um, what we tried at the time was a, a develop a product which can compete on a cost level with um, tape and with, with hard disks, but it adds the high reliability uh, to, the, to the equation so that you get a, a cost-effective solution which lasts a very long time and it relieves you of the continuous uh, data migration and uh, continuous backups you have to do. When we started this development, um, the, the big problem was, well, media are expensive, optical media are expensive, and that we could change. For data center applications, we could change this. Uh, the next hurdle we had to take is that the optical media traditionally were used in, in optical libraries on, on media trays. And these trays are, you know, bulky and we could um, really in the past use optical storage in, in a single device up to like 100 terabytes. That was kind of the limit we had uh, before we started the new development of high density optical storage. Now what we do with that is we um, pack the, the uh, optical media in, in cartridges, look like this cartridge has uh, 12 media and um, this cartridge has about the form factor of a, an LTO uh, medium and at this time with 100 gig media the capacity of this, um, this cartridge is 1.2 terabyte and um, in the third quarter we will have 300 gigabyte media and the capacity of this, uh, this cartridge here will be 3.6 terabytes. Mm. Now that's higher density, higher physical density than LTO6. Now that is getting important. Now and then we developed large libraries based on this high density cartridge concept and we could pack up to a thousand of these cartridges into a single library, single library. That means we can pack a petabyte based on the 100 gig technology in one library and up to three petabytes by the third quarter of this year. Now here on this, uh, on this chart, you see on the left hand side, you see a cartridge. Um, it's, this one is a translucent model to show actually what it looks like. But on the right hand side you see a device for a, it's a standard 19U rack, uh, sorry, a standard 19 inch rack, 42U high for a normal um, data set, for a normal um, IT center. And this one uh, comes with 860 terabytes and 2.5 petabytes uh, with a 300 gig technology and this is price competitive with tape. Now, still we could say optical, well that's a slow technology, but also there, there's a major development. The 300 gig technology will come initially with a data transfer rate of uh, 38, uh, 36 megabytes per second. That still sounds like slow. But then next year in 2016, we will see multi-head drives, which will actually push the transfer rates in the 300 to 400 megabyte per second range. Now that makes a major difference. Now you all of a sudden have the uh, uh, double the, the data rate of, of tape and you get into similar data rates of, of even SSD. Wow. That will be a game changer, I feel, in the optical technology um, um, usage in, in professional environments. Wow, I mean, if you can make a product that actually competes with the transfer rates of SSDs, yeah, I could see that, especially since you're talking about a technology that is infinitely less expensive than trying to make one of those large array SSDs. Uh, we've got a couple of questions from the chat room that I, I think actually are, are quite good. Untoward wanted to touch on something that you've already mentioned, and that is optical versus tape, because we, we're now talking about uh, technologies that are used more for archive than for immediately accessible information. And he wants to know why would he go with optical rather than tape? 
Well, optical um, has the advantage of a faster access. Let me give you an example. If you would be in a news broadcast environment, you would want uh, to use optic optical uh, storage technology for your archive most probably because you have s short news clips. And if you would uh, access these uh, from tape on a frequent uh, basis in a network, then this then tape would have a problem with this uh, and tape would um, get into reliability issues this is where optical has an advantage it has a direct access and it is um, it is a uh, it is usable for for uh, for a network environment where users directly access um, the the data on on the optical devices Right. M5 wants to know about, well, you know, these speeds are obviously for, for read. And mm -hmm. once you've got it written onto a Blu-ray disc, if you do it right, if you create your optical array correctly, you can get those amazing transfer rates. But uh, I throw back at you, you, you wouldn't expect writes of this, right? I mean, this, this is not writing speed. You, this is still an archive technology, which you just happen to be able to access very quickly. Well, the write uh, speed for, for, for the faster drives will be about half of the uh, speeds I was talking about. So the write speed will be in the order of 150 to 200 megabytes per second. There is also a new technology where the write speed could be up to 90% of the uh, read uh, transfer rate. Uh, I, I have to say, if you're watching the chat room right now, Horst, you are you are making some converts over here. They're, uh, just like we, th we thought at the very beginning, people were saying, well, optical's dead. This is silly. Why are we talking mm -hmm. about this? People are now st starting to say, wait a minute, something that can be as fast as some of the fastest SSD arrays out there, something that can last way longer than any other medium because it's not actually being touched, and something that is ridiculously, relatively inexpensive compared to all other options. So I guess the, the last question I would, I would give you in this segment before we move on and bring in my co-hosts is where do you want to see this technology penetrate the enterprise uh, or beyond the enterprise? Do you see this being used in the movie industry, in government? Uh, what, what is your vision for the use of super high-speed optical storage? Well, there is... I could say all the, all of the above, but uh, in reality, you can you can do such a, um, uh, a high uh, such a prof professional library for data centers. You can use it in broadcast environments. You can can actually use it, use it for national labs. Uh, they have to store a lot of data, and when they, they when they want to get to the data, they want to get the data fast. Now, if you have a 300 or 400 megabyte per second drive, and you have like 12 or more drives of this type in one device, I mean, you get a very, very uh, big uh, bandwidth, which actually is, is a challenge for the network. So I think that is all of the above, really, where we feel in the archive market, uh, we, can, we have a very good opportunity with this technology. Now, Optical also is a write once technology as it's used here. It is not a rewritable technology, so it is not suitable for, for backup. We are talking about an archive technology. Right. And one of the things I think it's, it's very important for people to keep in mind is that we're not suggesting that this is going to replace everything. You don't suddenly throw everything out because you have got optical technology. Perfect. There is a very good use for it and actually we're going to be talking about that after the break. But first, let's take one more pause to thank the third sponsor of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and it's got to be Ring Central. Now, Ring Central brings all of your phone systems together in the cloud. That's voice, that's fax, that's text, that's conference calling, high def video meetings, all of that in one place. Now, we love doing things in the cloud here at Twit, and we love Ring Central. Ring Central does it all and it does the things that I need in my communications package. It integrates with both iOS and Android devices so that your team can stay connected from anywhere, no matter what device they're using. Ring Central lets you keep your existing numbers using toll-free numbers, local extensions, and even vanity numbers, and you can easily customize your system from a web browser or from their mobile apps, so it works the way you want it to work. And if you're worried about privacy, and who isn't these days, well, don't, because your calls are encrypted and private with Secure Voice. 
Now, this, this is really exciting. Ring Central just announced Ring Central for Google. So now you can integrate your company's Google for Work accounts with Ring Central. It becomes one seamless communications hub. Now, with Ring Central for Google, your staff can use the dial pad on your screen to make calls from your Gmail account. You can click any number on the screen in Gmail, contacts, or calendar to place a call, just like on your smartphone. You could listen to voicemails directly within Gmail. All of this means is that you're extending the interface so you, again, get to use Ring Central the way you want to use it. Plus, you get faxing from Google Drive, viewing text messages, scheduling conference calls, and so much more. Ring Central has customer, customer support free and 24-7, as always, and there are no setup fees or activation fees. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to try Ring Central. Ring Central starts at under $25 a month per user, and you can start right now with a 30-day risk-free trial. Plus, here's a special offer for Twit listeners. For every desk phone you buy, you get a second phone free, up to 20 phones. Visit ringcentral.com or call 800-543-9980. That's 800-543-9980 and use the promo code TWIT. And we thank Ring Central for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. I want to bring back in my co-host, Curtis and Shebert. I've been having this conversation with Horst. There is one glaring omission from this conversation, and it goes hand in hand with this idea that there's a, a place for every type of technology, especially a, a high performance technology like optical. And that is not everything needs to be accessible all the time. We talked about this a little bit with the Sony breach, which is if Sony had had proper data management, data handling, data expiration techniques and procedures on the books, then maybe the breach wouldn't have been so bad. Chebert, you deal with this quite a bit, right? I mean, our, our, our MO the last 15 years, because storage has become so cheap and so ubiquitous and so readily available, especially through the web, we have a feeling like we need to keep every byte of information accessible from every device, no matter where we are, no matter what the time. Yeah, sure. But let, let's take this, uh, you know, the discussion really isn't keeping everything online. The discussion is more about how you can get to it reliably. Uh, here in Hawaii, where we have humidity and temperature going hand in hand, the average lifespan of a uh, tape, uh, tape cartridge is about two years. And even then, we've done several restores where, oh my God, the cartridge is dead. Uh, how we've got to go back more and more and more cartridge. So restore takes a much longer time. What I'm putting, um, horse product into a lot of grants is how do we archive data, hydrophone data, engineering data, um, environmental data. I don't necessarily need to have it all online. What I want to be able to do is use the ability that this system has to have a NAS front end or storage system front end, store it on there, and I can apply business rules. And those business rules will then say, okay, at a certain time and condition, let's throw it onto the uh, optical disk, but keep the metadata online so that I can still search for it, I can still you know, manage it, but when I need it, I can touch it or start accessing it and it'll be brought back. If the magazine is no longer physically mounted in the jukebox, it can create an operator interrupt that will then go and say, you know, operator, please load magazine such and such, and I can pull it off the shelf, it's got an RFID in it, throw it back into the machine, and get access to it. Not only that, it uses significantly less power than the same amount of spinning disk storage, it weighs a heck of a lot less, and it requires dramatically less cooling. Now, if you're in an older building or you need to be able to do this, it's probably going to save you a heck of a lot mo more money over something, say, like compact shelves. You know, you want to go electronic, you want to be able to store it, but you still need access to it, you still need to be able to search for it, that's why I'm trying to buy one. And if my dean's watching, please, dean, I want to buy one. Please, please, please. Horst, what about that? It, it seems silly to have to say it, but if you're worried about the security of your sensitive data on your network, probably the best possible security you can have is not to have it connected to the network, but accessible. Do you run into this with your clients? Is, is there the desire for that, that possible air gap. You have the cartridge in a, in a carousel, but not currently accessible. 
Sure, we actually have offline libraries and with uh, current magazine technologies with RFIDs, this is a, a solution. We are selling this solution. Um, let me give you an example. Um, if you are a large manufacturer of, um, let's say, jet engine uh, parts, and uh, you need to store the x-rays of each part uh, because of regulation. You need to store these x-rays for as long as the plane is in the air. What do you do with these x-rays? I mean, you can store the x-rays in a warehouse or you can store the x-rays on a uh, system like this, on a cartridge, and put these either in a library or in an offline, offline library. These uh, cartridges or magazines have a, an RFID chip in it and as soon as you insert, we insert a magazine into the storage device, the RFID is read and the file system is updated and data is available immediately. Now, these companies actually want, same in, in military solutions, these companies want to remove the data actually from, from online. They want to have it offline. They don't want to have it accessible immediately. Curtis, let me ask you again from, from the executive enterprise side. Do you hear a lot of talk, especially on Information Week Radio, about developing a plan, a comprehensive data management plan that includes taking things offline or taking things nearline? We do, and the nice thing is we hear about it from a number of sources. I mean, you, you've got this coming at us from, from several different points of view. One that we've been talking about, of course, is the performance point of view. Uh, the other, as, uh, as Brian mentioned, is the whole security point of view. Another one that we have to look at is the legal point of view, and, and I can't overemphasize the extent to which regulations and concerns about issues like um, legal, the word just left me and I apologize, discovery, there we go, legal discovery and other aspects of court cases govern the behavior of executives. If you can convince someone that taking things offline, putting them in you know, near line storage, whereas we've said they're offline but accessible, reduces their exposure to legal action, reduces their potential liability, then I think that the executives become very interested, really regardless of what implications about heat, environmental issues, and data processing performance might be. All right. Horst, we've got uh, a, a member of the chat room, JJ to the 4884, who has asked several times, if this is technology that is eventually going to trickle its way down to SMB slash enthusiasts, people who, who want to start working with optical solutions and see what kind of products they can develop based on your technologies, is that going to happen or, is, or do you see this staying mostly high-end, high enterprise? No, actually we have uh, even devices for, for these cartridges, um, single drive, uh, two cartridges so that you can also mirror uh, the cartridge. Um, and those are in the three to four thousand dollar range. So, I mean, this is the, the price of a, of a tape drive. And in, in this case here as an optical solution, you get a complete NAS solution for this and you get the exchangeable uh, uh, cartridges. Uh, so I feel that's a quite a competitive and, and uh, um, a competitive product, and that could be used for you know the the small office uh, environment. And I want to leave you with the last question of the episode, and, and that is, if you were going to talk to a, a, a young IT person, an admin who was looking at implementing your technology and also approaching his executives about implementing proper data management solutions and procedures, what would be the advice that you would give to him or her? What would you want to say about using this technology in an actual network? Well, you would, in, in a, uh, let's say, in a data center environment, you would always use optical only as a third level uh, device. 
meaning you have um, SSD, you have, you have faster uh, levels uh, ahead of, of uh, the, the archive. But in other environments, let's say in broadcasting, you, um, you, will, um, you want to have an archive which is accessible um, and uh, you would make that accessible in a network to people who, who pull in uh, some clips for, for the evening news and they want to do that just in the last 30 minutes. So they want to have fairly fast access to the, to the archive. They want to do the search on, on metadata basis, want to see a, a low resolution clip, say this is the right clip, uh, the, this is the clip I want and this clip uh, comes from the low resolution clip comes from cache and then they want to pull in the high resolution clip from the archive. So there will be different uh, uh, scenarios and you will have the, the uh, data center example where you have to store you know petabytes and petabytes but you will also have the environment of the um, you know medical sto medical uh, storage or industrial x-ray storage or broadcast storage where um, the data is accessed directly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, gentlemen, I'm afraid that we've used up all our allotted time and then some. You've been listening to the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. That's according to nine out of 10 tape drives. I want to thank our panelists for being here and for giving us a fascinating discussion about the future of optical in the enterprise. Uh, let, let's start with you, Horse. I, I want to give you time here to talk directly to our audience. Tell them where they can find you, where they can find HIC, HIT Archive Corporation, where they can find out more about your solutions and your technology. Well, um, I think we have the, the data on the screen. Um, we, are log we are a US company. Um, we manufacture in, uh, in, the, in Germany as well as in, in China. And um, our um, office in the US is in Cupertino, California. And you can contact us under hit-archive.com. Thank you. Horst, Horst, it's been fantastic to have you on the show. Thank you very much. Of course, I want to thank my co-host, starting with Mr. Brian Chi Chibert. Hopefully your dean is watching this episode and he will now let you buy a fantastic optical array. But if he's not, uh, do you want to tell your audience where they could find your dean so they could ask him to let you buy an optical array? Actually, what I want to do is I want to do one last little tidbit. A lot of people ask, well, what happens, you know, if it's an archive solution, what happens when, say, ultraviolet ray comes out? The really cool thing about these drives is you can go and put in the new drive, and one of the utilities is to migrate to the new technology. Um, that's no, I'm surprised nobody in the chat room asked about that. I know. Fantastic. And uh, did you want to give your dean's email address? No. Oh, dang. Okay, well, maybe next time. I also want to thank Curtis Franklin from Information Week Radio. Curtis, where can the Twilight Riot find you and your programming? Well, Padre, I'm writing pretty frequently at informationweek.com. Would love it if people would come by, check out my pieces there, and uh, comment on them. We've got radio a couple of times a week. Tuesdays are always interop radio, where we bring you the best of interop in radio format that's at 3 p.m eastern time find us on blog talk radio or that is uh, also in a podcast on itunes of course friday afternoons are information week live where we look at uh, the week that was on information week we'd love to have the uh, the twiat riot join the conversation at any or all of those curtis cheerbert horst it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so very much and also thank you that's right, the person who's listening or watching right now. Without you, we don't have a show, so we want to make it easier for you to get our show. If you go to our show page at twit.tv slash twiet, you'll find all of our back episodes. That includes the links and the stories and, and also a place where you can automatically subscribe so you can get every episode in the format that you want onto your device of choice. Do you want the audio version on your iPhone so you can listen in your car? Maybe you want the small video version on your Android tablet so you can watch on your break. Or perhaps you want the high definition version so you can watch This Week in Enterprise Tech in all its enterprise glory on your big screen TV. Well, you can do that by going to twit.tv slash twiet.
Also, don't forget that I am on the Twitters. Follow me at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's at PadreSJ. If you follow me, you'll be able to find out what we're doing each week for the show, and you'll be able to suggest topics and guests for future episodes. You'll also find out what I do when I'm not on the network. That's right. You can find when I'm flying quadcopters or playing with doges or doing the Princess Bride with quadcopters and doges. It's, you know, it's, it's sort of a variation on a theme, really. Oh, by the way, I was also left shark. If you want to know what I do here on the Twit TV network, that includes This Week in Enterprise Tech on Mondays or Padres Corner on Tuesdays or Know How and Coding 101 on Thursdays. Twitter.com slash PadresJ is the place to go. Also, I want to mention that we do this show live. That's right. Right now, we're doing it Mondays, 2.30 p.m. Pacific time. But starting in March, we're actually moving to Fridays at 1 o'clock p.m. Pacific time. We're doing this because, well, there's a lot of reasons, but also because some of our audience has said they would prefer to have it on Fridays so they could catch it live. I mean, you could go to live.twit.tv to catch us in all our liveness. That's right. You can watch the pre-show, the post-show, everything that goes in between so that, uh, well, you see the bloopers that we have to cut out when we do our downloaded version. And as long as you're watching live, why not jump into our chat room? You'll see me pulling questions from the chat room all the time. Just go to irc.twit.tv and you'll meet members of the Twit TV army. Finally, I want to thank everyone here in the Brick House who makes this show possible. To Lisa and Leo for letting me do my show. For Karsten, my super producer. And to Mr. Cranky Hippo, Brian Burnett, my TD extraordinaire. Without him, I would not have the moral fortitude to go on. Brian, could you please tell the folks at home where they can find you on the Twit TV network? Uh, they can find me doing Know How with you, which we'll be doing a pre-record. Uh, for those of you still watching live, hang out. Uh, we'll be doing a Know How later today. But typically, it's Thursdays at 11 o'clock Pacific time. Tune in then. Fantastic. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Balasser, just reminding you that if you want to know what's going on in the Enterprise, just keep twice.